We're landing on Mars exactly in uh, 30 days. Uh, it would be um, 2.53 Toronto time uh, in the afternoon when we land. Uh, somewhere around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Mars local time, where we land. So I'm going to uh, quickly tell you a little bit about how do we go there and how do we land and what, we, uh, what we're planning to do. All right, so um, we have landed, we as we humans, have landed on Mars successfully seven times before. And so this is the eighth time, hopefully, if it would be successful. Uh, the difference between this and all the previous ones is that uh, the previous ones studied the surface of Mars. Uh, with this one, we're going to try to peer inside of Mars. Uh, and the name of the, uh, the lander that's going to land uh, is called InSight. So, uh, the uh, question is why would be interested in the interior of Mars? First of all, having sat through all day today, you need to switch hat, right? The goal of uh, space science is knowledge, right? It's probably not going to be monetized anytime soon. So don't think about profit margin. This is not what you know, uh, this mission uh, is all about. But the reason you're interested to know what's inside uh, the planet Mars, or in fact, inside any planet, is because the planet encompasses a heat engine at the core that drives most of the processes that happens underneath and also on the surface. And that also determines whether the planet can be habitable or not. So that is the reason why uh, we, we are interested in it. Um, so the way we're going to do this thing, we're going to give Mars the first real checkup it has had in four and a half billion years. And we are going to use scientific instruments to essentially take the pulse of the planet by uh, seismometry, uh, take the temperature of the planet through the heat flow, and also um, the, its ref reflexes uh, through radio science. So let's uh, first talk about the uh, seismometry. Most of you probably know, how is it that we know the structure inside of the Earth? People have not been uh, traveling inside of the Earth. So the way we know how Earth is layered is through seismic waves. When there is earthquake, the waves from the earthquake travels through the various layers of the Earth with different velocities and different attenuation. So when we look at the seismic waves, it bears the signature of the layers that it passed through. So that is how uh, we're going to do that on Mars as well. We're going to send a seismometry on Mars, and we're going to measure Mars quakes. So that's the, the first thing. The second thing, we're going to take the temperature of Mars. We're going to drill into Mars about five feet in the heat probe, and it's going to drag behind it a science tether that is going to measure the gradients of heat escaping uh, from Mars. And finally, uh, we're going to uh, measure what we call the impulse of Mars. So as Mars is just rotating around its axis, the axis itself, it is, um, it is tracing a circle like you see up there, and the velocity is very much correlated to density of the core. So through that, we can find out whether we have a solid core, whether we have a liquid core. And so these are the three uh, schemes that we are going to use. Okay, so that's after we get to Mars. Let's talk a little bit about how do you get to Mars. Right? So what you see here is we going around the orbit, around uh, the sun, and the Mars is going uh, around its orbit. And every 26 months, the two planets get very close. Well, if you call 34 million miles close, right? And so the, uh, most people think, OK, so we wait every 26 months when the two planets get very close. Then we make a dash for it, and that's how we go to Mars. As it turns out, that is not how you go to Mars, because it is energetically very expensive to do it that way. So instead, we go the long way, right? So we send the spacecraft 
to where, not that where Mars is now, but where Mars is going to be, uh, and then hope that the spacecraft planet come together at the same time and you know, they have an encounter. Um, if I give you an analogy, those of you who know American football, when the quarterback throws the ball, it doesn't throw the ball to where the receiver is. It throws the ball to where the receiver is going to be. Hopefully, the ball and the receiver come together and he catches it. The only difference is that uh, if he doesn't catch it, no big deal. You come to the huddle and call another play. Right here, if the spacecraft and planet Mars don't come together, you lose about a billion dollars. So you need to be uh, you know, uh, pretty precise. So to give you a sense of how precise you have to be, I have an analogy for you. Uh, it is like um, you would hit a golf ball on the East Coast of the United States and try to aim it at a um, stadium near where I live, Pasadena, called Rose Ball, and not only try to sink the ball into the stadium, but into a particular section, into a particular row, into a particular seat, and if the guy is having a beer, you drop the golf ball right into the cup. So this is roughly the precision that we are going to need. And if you're not terribly impressed by that, let's have the rose ball also move about at 50 miles per hour, because that's what <laughs> planet Mars does, right? It's just not standing there allowing you to uh, throw dart at it. So as precise as that is, this is not the hardest part of getting to Mars. It takes about eight months, six, depending on opportunity, six to eight months before we, we get to Mars. And by now, we have that figured out. The hardest part of the journey is the last seven minutes, which we have come to affectionately call the seven minutes of terror. The reason for it is, that you arrive at the Martian space, which is defined to be 80 miles above the surface, and at that time you're screaming toward the surface at 13,000 miles per hour. And you have basically seven minutes to slow it down, or you're gonna make a billion dollar crater in the surface of Mars, right? Which is uh, uh, not desired. Okay, so the way we do that, we design a extremely, um, a sophisticated brake system, and it looks like this. The uh, first part, we um, barrel through the atmosphere of Mars, and Mars has a uh, atmosphere which is very thin, is about 1% of the Earth. But nonetheless, when you're going 13 miles per hour, 130,000 miles per hour, the friction slows you down, uh, down some. But it gets very hot. It gets about 3,000 degrees in the front, and if you don't protect it, you're gonna burn up. So you have to give it a really good heat shield, you know, to a slowdown. Then after you have slowed down to a supersonic, uh, then you can pop a parachute, and the parachute will further slow you down. And finally, when you get near the surface, you do one of these three things. In 2004, what we did, when we got to a couple of hundred miles, a couple of hundred uh, meters, we popped a uh, set of airbags, and then we cut the rope, and this airbag bounced on the surface of Mars like a basketball, and then came to a stop, and then you deflate it, and the rover came out of it. So that's one method of doing it. Then in 2012, because we had a much bigger vehicle rover and wouldn't fit in an airbag, we invented what we called a sky crane, where uh, this thing lowers the rover to the surface, at the end of some ropes, and then when the uh, wheels hit the surface, you cut the ropes, the sky crane goes and crashes, and then you have delivered. What are we going to do 30 days from now is that when we get to a couple of hundred feet, uh, a couple of hundred meters, we're gonna power our way down with uh, some retro rockets. Uh, this is not the most sophisticated way of doing it, but we had some leftover hardware, and that is, in order to economize, you know, we decided to go this particular way. So I'm going to show you a one-minute movie of how this whole process goes, the seven minutes of terror. 
Um, I didn't have the latest one, the one that's going to land in 30 days. So I'm going to show you the one that we did in 2004 when I managed the Mars program. That's the airbag one. And you will see how we delivered that. Uh, it is pretty much the same except for the last couple of hundred meters where you use different techniques. So let's take a look at, uh, and by the way, uh, some of this is simulation and some of it is real images. Uh, you know, there is no CNN to measure, you know, to record the landing. So that part is simulation. The part of us uh, in the control room that night going crazy, that's, that's real. And by the way, the one-way um, uh, travel, uh, light travel, is 10 minutes. The most excruciating part of that night or that day, 30 days from now, when we're there, is that you know that the spacecraft has landed one way or the other, successfully or not, 10 minutes ago, and you have no idea until you start getting the, uh, the signal. So let's take a look at the, um, the, the landing uh, movie. When it works, it's fun. <laughs> I've been there when it hasn't worked. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> um, all right. So um, this is the end of that. I'm going to show you uh, two more slides uh, because a lot of what we saw today, people were talking about small satellites, cube sats, and there there is a commercial um, application for small sats. So. Um, in addition to what's landing on Mars, we're also building two CubeSats, uh, which are like about 14 kilograms, and it fits, uh, as you can see, in your hand. And so the reason that we, we and we have two of these things trailing inside to Mars, uh, like almost a duck and duckling, you know, you know, going to Mars. The reason is that that seven minutes when we land, uh, we have failed a couple of times, and we had no... Um, there is no black box when you crash into, uh, into Mars. And even if there was, you couldn't retrieve it. So the only way we can is to watch the landing and communicate with it. So if something goes wrong, we know exactly at what stage. Did the parachute not open? Did the engine not fire? Did the airbag not uh, pop? So we always like to have something overhead during that seven minutes when you descend. So should you fail, you have, in essence, your black box. Now, in this particular case, when we're landing, uh, we have assets on Mars, but none of them are overhead at a time. So we decided to take our orbiters with us. So we have two of these uh, vehicles that are going to Mars, trailing inside. And once inside starts going down, these two are overhead, relays the signal, and we get it in the control room that, in fact, you know, whether we have landed or not. And finally, my last slide 
is that we are about a month away and one of these little boys has taken this image of Mars, so that's where it is. Uh, this came down a couple of days ago uh, and, uh, and it's gonna get big very quickly uh, as we get closer and so uh, wherever you are on the 23rd of November at 2 p.m. to 53 p.m. Set your watches. Um, either we're gonna go crazy again in a control room, or I'm not gonna show up at CDL anymore. <laughs> Thank you very much.